Hey, it's Sonia, and welcome to the Smarter Podcast. I cannot wait to get into today's conversation with the one and only Scott Greenberg. He's the author of two amazing books that we're going to talk about today, Stop the Shift Show and The Wealthy Franchisee, Game-Changing Steps to Becoming a Thriving Franchise Superstar. Now, to tell you a little bit more about Scott Greenberg, whose journey from a successful multi-unit franchise owner to an award-winning business speaker and author is packaged with valuable lessons on leadership, mindset, and emotional intelligence. Now, Scott's experience as a former owner of Edible Arrangements franchises taught him the critical importance of a strong team culture and outstanding customer service. His franchises were constantly top-ranked in sales, won awards for best customer service, and even earned him Manager of the Year out of over 1,000 locations. Scott's approach centers around one key philosophy. Businesses don't just run on products and services, they thrive on people. He has cracked the code on how to build a high-performance workforce by focusing on the human element at the heart of every business. His books, articles, and workshops offer actionable strategies that transform businesses by elevating the mindset of both leaders and employees. And now, without further ado, here's Scott. Scott, I'd like to welcome you to the Smarta Podcast family. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm great to be here too. Great to be part of the family. I cannot wait to unpack the conversation that we're going to have today. And I want to start you off with if you could speak directly to the person listening. If they're going to follow everything that you're going to share with us today to heart, how will their lives change? I think that if people really sort of take the advice of, you know, things that we're going to talk about, they're going to live a better life. They are going to be their best selves. It doesn't mean they won't occasionally face adversity, but they'll have the most of what it takes to overcome that adversity and achieve goals. So there's a lot in life that we don't control, but when we focus on the areas where we do have control and really put our heart and soul into that, it gives us a much better shot of living the life we want. Mm Mm-hmm. Surely. And having this different perspective, perhaps, can help them tackle situations that come their way easier. So, yeah, yeah for sure. Mm-hmm. I want to take you to a couple of your accomplishments that I want to mention, which is your journey that started with the edible arrangements and how you built and owned this franchise in West Hollywood, California and how you turned it into such a successful multi-unit franchise business, which is one of the region's highest selling stores and is also awarded best customer service out of 800 stores, which I want to mention because it's, I, in my opinion, such a big accomplishment. And the first question that I want to ask you on this is what is the biggest lesson that you learned from this experience? Uh, could I share two things? Because it's hard to know which is the, yes, the biggest. Yes, of course. The okay. more, the more. So one of them was humility. Because the, I'll be honest with you that, you know, in, in a person's bio or their resume, they put the great things. They don't mm. put the terrible things, even though the terrible things are what we learn from the most. I went into it. I'd already been a full-time motivational speaker for 13 or 14 years. So I thought I had all this wisdom. Because I could, I could recite all the cliches like "there is no I in team" and you know things like that. Yeah. And then when I actually tried it in the real world with real employees, my own business, they didn't care how you spell the word team. <laughs> no, none of that. You know, we brainstormed our values and our mission statement, and they're like, "What time do we get to take our break?" Like, it just didn't translate. So I had to unlearn what I thought that I knew, and come to the business with less pride and more curiosity. So that was the one thing is to keep an, an open mind to continuously improve and and not let your own ego get in the way. That was one thing. The second thing that I learned, and I, I mentioned this um, in one of my books, is to use your business to improve the lives of everyone it touches. So it's not just for my customers, it's also my employees and with the suppliers, the people who are delivering things. Anybody who's involved in my business, I saw as a customer, even my employees. A customer is anyone who's not you. So I just thought, 
I'm just going to try to use this business just to help people, to make them feel good and improve their lives. And there's sort of a boomerang effect when you do that. You know, you, you get back what you put out there. And so that mentality, rather than just how much can I sell, uh, that really served me and, and helped the business succeed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Humility and how can you make your business improve and everyone it touches is, I think, a great place to start because it just reminds the person listening to take a step back from the usual stuff that they can hear about, oh, you need to lead a team and have these hard skills um, instead of the soft skills that usually can lead you more on a journey than the rest. Scott, I want to give you a situation now. Okay. Picture a student that's fresh out of high school or freshly graduated with a diploma in economics or business from college and is fixed on this idea of starting a business. I want to focus you here on the idea of a franchise because it's something that we I never had on a podcast on my podcast before and I want to really go deep into it. They don't know if buying the franchise is the best way to go or the right decision. And you're trying to persuade this person that it is the smart decision. So what would you tell them? Why do you think buying a franchise is the right way to go? I don't think it's the right decision for everyone. Um, I think it's the right decision for some people. It's funny, you you know, you mentioned someone who just got their diploma, just graduated high school. <laughs> My daughter just graduated high school. She's now in her first year of college. My son is in his last year of college. Like they're sort of the group that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I look at both of them and I think <laughs> to myself, at least who they are today, a franchise would not necessarily be good for one of them. I think both, there are some people who thrive in a structured environment where mm -hmm. there are there are levels of management and you are getting feedback And people are sort of holding your hand and taking you forward. Like some people really thrive in that environment. For me, um, I don't do well in the sandbox with other kids. I don't play. Mm -hmm. What that means is I sort of like to run my own thing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's advantages and disadvantages. You know, the advantages, you know, most people said, I don't want to have a boss. I want to be the boss. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Um that, you know, the more I put into it, the more I'm going to get, I'm sort of in control of my destiny, but it also means that I wasn't necessarily getting feedback. I wasn't necessarily getting um, all the support that I could have used during rough times in a franchise system. You do get some, but you really need a bit more grit than if you just have a, a regular job. So it's not for everyone. Uh, but for those people who really have what it takes, it's wonderful mm -hmm. because you are in charge of your destiny and you can succeed. I mean, I knew I wanted to have my own business, but I didn't know what it was or how to do it. So in a franchise, they've created the successful business model and have figured out how to replicate it. So I don't have to figure out, you know, edible arrangements makes floral arrangements out of fruit. I didn't have to figure out how to do that or how to run the business, they could teach me. So then my job was then to execute their system Um, and then do lots of marketing, but then bring out the best of my team and provide amazing customer service. That's the stuff that I was interested in. I wasn't interested in figuring out how to you know, create the product and create the system. I was really interested in the people side. Maybe it's because I was a motivational speaker for all those years. So I think if someone is really interested in, in working for themselves and having their own business and they have grit and they have resilience and they're willing to fight through the tough times, but they just don't have the idea for the business, then a franchise could be a really good choice for them. I love that. All right. And I want to explore the idea of your experience as a public speaker into motivating your team and what advice in particular you would give to a manager who's trying to attract talented and motivated people to join their hourly workforce. Uh, yeah. And that's not a theoretical question for me. That's a question that I had for 10 years when I was the owner and I had a management staff. And that is exactly what we had to do. Um, and I will say that there is a difference between being a motivational speaker and boss. Some of the big things that I say on stage to a huge audience, one-on-one -on -one are super annoying. 
as you know, my <laughs> yeah. wife and kids have reminded me. You know what I mean? My wife came home from a really bad day at work once. And I said, you know, Rachel, you get to choose your attitude. <laughs> and she didn't talk to me for a week. I mean, that was just so not helpful, right? You can say that on stage, but one-on-one. -on -one. And so in a business environment, I had to like leave the motivational speaker stuff at home, at least in terms of talking to people that way and have a bit more empathy and a lot more listening and ask a lot more questions. Having said that, your question is, how could I get my, how can I help my manager? Was it attract hourly workers or what specifically were you asking? Attract talented and motivated people to join their workforce. Sure. Um, so we were very careful in our help wanted posts, the kind of language that we used. We didn't just say, you know, wanted customer service representative. I always looked at help wanted posts as another form of advertising. You know, if we were trying to market and advertise to get customers, you're telling a story. You're trying to get people excited, right? You're tapping into their emotions. You're not just telling about the product. You're talking about how this is going to make your life better and it make you laugh or, you know, whatever, right? Being really deliberate. Well, it occurred to me that if we want to get great employees, we need to do the same thing. We have to have in our help wanted posts, um, mm -hmm. kind of language and tell a story about not just what they're going to get, but how they're going to feel, right? What our culture is like. And so, uh, you know, I would talk with my managers about always think about the human experience, whether we're serving customers, attracting employees, motivating employees. People are, more, are more, much more motivated by how they feel than by what they get. They're more motivated by what happens in the heart than in the brain. So let's make sure that we're always sort of tapping into people's emotions. And I could get back to like stuff from Aristotle where he talks about logos, ethos, and pathos. And pathos is the emotional piece. That's really what motivates us much more than anything. Mm -hmm. So um, the idea is to make sure that we're talking human to human, tapping the people's emotions, making good on our promises, and not just focusing on what employees get and trying to tempt them with more money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Now, I want to take you forward in time from this situation with a student who's thinking about a a franchise to having one and is thinking about how they can grow it. I want you to talk to me also a little bit about your experience and how you managed to create such a successful one and really level it up. Sure. So that is sort of the ultimate question that I get when I give speeches in the franchise industry. Because everyone's asking the same question. What can I do to grow my business? Mm -hmm. More customers, higher sales. Yeah, how do you do it, right? Uh, and my, you know, my first book is all about that. It's called The Wealthy Franchisee. And I talk about the best franchisees in all these different companies and what they all have in common. So let me first say that the hard skills piece is important. You need to do your marketing. You need okay. to provide, you know, the quality uh, products, you know, all those kinds of things. Just because I'm a motivational speaker doesn't mean I tell people, hey, you know, don't worry about the fundamentals of running the business. Like all that stuff is really important. So all these people who will succeed in franchising, they work very hard and they stick to the system. Um, they watch their numbers. They make sure they don't spend too much right? They really kind of keep an eye on their profit and loss statements and all that boring stuff that I'm sure that people who are listening to this podcast aren't interested in. So that's just the basics. You can't do anything unless that gets done. That may, that helps you become a decent, moderately successful franchisee. But the great franchisees, what they all have in common is mastery also of all those, the human th stuff. That's what helped me grow my business. And that's what they do. So meaning that they are really good at managing their own mindset where they would be humble and curious, always wanting to improve themselves and improve the business. Mm -hmm. They're really great at managing people, mm -hmm. right? Like really helping their employees not just work, but grow and develop them, focusing on inspiring them. And then for me, this is what really made the difference, um, was providing an absolute unbelievable customer experience. I went into the business thinking uh, that, you know, I'm not really good at marketing. I didn't want to spend the money. I probably should have done more marketing than I did. But my theory was, if we could do an amazing job and make sure everybody left with better emotions than when they came, and we're like, wow, those people are great. They would remember us, talk about us, and want to come back for more. 
So I wanted to convert and I trained my employees that every single person who walks in, that transaction is as much a marketing opportunity as it is just a sale. So I said, I want you to treat them in a way where they can't help but want to tell everyone they know about how great the experience was and they want to come back. Right. Like I literally thought about like brain science, like if something really awesome happens to you, there's a dopamine release in your brain. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is associated with like pleasure and that kind of stuff. And when the brain experiences that, it creates a desire to have more. Um, And so I wanted to make sure I know it sounds kind of technical and weird, but everybody who walked into our door, I want to make sure there was an increase in dopamine production in their brain. So mm-hmm. what do we have to do? How do we have to speak to them? What do we have to give to them? How do we have to treat them? So they left thinking, wow, that was fantastic. And that served us so well. Because for mm-hmm. my customers, it made it more fun because they weren't just facilitating transactions. They were like, really, every customer trying to figure out what do they want and how can I blow their minds? And then it feels good to do that for people. And honestly, you know, we were in this gift basket business. So as it is, it's positive. It's a celebration business. It's People celebrating and giving gifts and uh, having something wonderful and colorful and tasty to enjoy. Mm-hmm. In that front, it was you know very positive, but this made it more fun. And so that's what happened. So we had be- amazing online reviews. And that's why we won those awards around you know, customer service, because it was just such a huge priority. That more than anything else led to higher sales. Bigger tickets, like a, every individual transaction was bigger, but more transactions because our customers became repeat customers, especially the angry ones. Because when someone was angry, all right, all you have to do is is show lots of empathy. You apologize and you make it right. And then you make it even better than right. That's how you turn an angry customer into a customer for life. So that was our specialty and that just paid off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to be honest, thinking about what you say, I started remembering actually all of the employees that stuck with me even as far as a year ago from multiple different countries who I just thought stood out from their personality and the way they approached a customer, especially if it was the one before me that, as you said, might have been on not such a positive mindset at the time. And I want to take you now because you mentioned that your kids are especially the age that I mentioned about just finishing college or just starting college. What advice would you give teenagers starting out these hourly jobs and sticking to this routine? Sure. So a few things. And and this is a little bit. So my daughter is working her very first job right now. Uh, It's in fast food. Uh Uh-huh. And. What I've tried to explain to her is I said, for the first time, you're now involved in something that's not about you. Mm -hmm. When you're in high school, maybe you're joining special programs or activities. And, you know, here in the U.S., there's lots of high schools very much about student activities and sports, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And all those things are created for the benefit of the student. Yeah. They're all programs to help the student grow. Once you get a job, that's not about the student. That is about the owner of the business who's trying to make money and the managers who are in charge of making that happen. Their concern isn't necessarily your well-being. I mean, if they're decent, it is, but it's not their primary concern. You exist to help the business grow. The business is not there to help you grow. And that's what school is, right? School exists and these programs to help you, the student, grow. That's not the case once you get a job, even if you are still a student. So I had to help my daughter really understand that perspective, that they're not there to accommodate you, They're not there to improve your life. It's the other way around. So you need to look at your your manager in particular and ask yourself, what does she need? What are her goals? What is her stress? And what can you do to relieve her stress? What can you do to that? I've said, what I want you to do is when you walk, when you get to work, when you walk in, you want the reaction to be, oh, good, Peyton's here because we know she's going to solve problems and she's going to make things better. Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing that I have told her and told my son when he had his first job is be there to be of service to make things better and make it about them. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the same thing, just to just to say, you know, know that you, you know, you want to, you know, communicate well and exist. And uh, I've tried to teach them what I call the platinum rule. There's the golden rule, which is treat other people the way you want to be treated. I reject that. And I reject it because. 
I don't know how you want to be treated. And you and I might have different values and want different things, right? So if I'm, if you're my customer, right? The way I want to be treated is, you know, maybe I want high quality, but what you want is speed or you want, you know, a discount or something. So the platinum rules treat people the way they want to be treated. And that includes the customer. It includes your boss. It includes everyone around you. That means you have to listen and pay attention and really try to figure out what are they looking for? What, what do they want? And then you try to accommodate that. I think if we can do that in life, in business, you know, in, in marriage, um, it, it comes back to us and it makes things better. So those are some of the conversations I've had with my kids. Mm -hmm. Definitely listening and becoming a listener, especially if you've been a speaker for a long time. And I also tend to do that with uh, with my own relationships, family, friendships is can really strengthen a bond or in your in cases like a franchise can make a one time customer a for a lifetime customer. And in in your work, you talk about fostering purpose and ownership among employees. So my question for you is, how do you create a sense of purpose and com uh, camaraderie, especially for workers who might see their job as temporary or transitional? Sure. Um, so, for, so let's talk about purpose. I think that people do have a, a, an innate desire to, to be part of something that's important to have impact. And a lot of companies, they just have these ridiculous over the top mission statements that no one knows, no one pays attention to, no one understands, no one cares about. So what I learned over time is to give my employees something aspirational about their, their work. What I didn't want is for them to show up and be like, their job is just to get through the, the end of the shift. I, you know, I wanted to give them something to aspire to. And so, you know, why do we exist? You know, and so I'd say, you know, we're we're here to help people celebrate the important occasions in their lives. So let's celebrate. Let's help people celebrate. So if someone calls and says, yes, I'd like to, you know, send a fruit basket to my sister. We'd say, what's the occasion? They would tell us the occasion. We'd be, that's fantastic. Congratulations. And that was just a little bit of a conversation. And they know that their job isn't just to take the order. Their job isn't just to sell, but their job is to help people celebrate. They like that. And then we had special days, like here in the United States, Valentine's Day um, is a very big holiday. It was the busiest day of the year here where people are expressing love to their husbands, wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, you know, sometimes, you know, family. And a lot of people like to send these fruit baskets and it was incredibly busy. And we'd have to bring a lot of temporary help. So before every shift early in the morning, I would stop all the work and I would just say everyone, hey, every single basket that we create today is going to be given from one person to another and it's going to be a moment for them where one person is saying i love you they're using the stuff that we create here that you're creating with your hands is going to make people love and feel loved and that's pretty cool and take pride from that and i want them to then look down at their work and say wow this isn't just skewers and strawberries and kale this is an expression of someone's love right and so just couching it in in those terms it really made a difference so that was one thing is that's, you know, talking about a purpose and trying to create a purpose that mattered to them as much as the customers. Um, that was effective. Then you asked about how to create a sense of camaraderie. Mm -hmm. uh, people are never, everyone says, well, I want my employees to feel like, you know, they're owners of the business. And I have a, I have a, a perfect way to make this happen. Give them a percentage of the business, make them partners. Now, most people are going to say, of course, I'm not going to do that, nor should you. They're never going to feel like an owner of the business unless you make them an owner. And it's unreasonable to expect that. You know, everyone's calls workers entitled. Who's entitled there? It's like, well, hey, I think they should act like owners. Well, they're not owners. Um, but they are owners of the culture. The culture of the business is theirs. And most people don't know what culture is. They think culture is, well, how, how nice are you to your employees? I ask you know, people all the time, what do you do to build culture in your business? Well, I buy them lunch and I celebrate their birthdays. Well, that's acts of kindness. That's great. That's not what culture is. Culture refers to our way of doing things, mm. right? And every group of two or more people has their traditions, their way of speaking, their way of interacting, which by the way, could be really toxic and unhealthy, but that's your, you know, every gang, right? Mm -hmm. Every prison block, 
the people within that prison block, they have their way of doing things. Absolutely. Um, you know, my family, we have our traditions, our way of doing things, which are different than the families who live next door to us, right? Because we have our own culture. So every group of two or more people has a culture. The best, they talk about it and they design it. Most, it just happens and it's not that good. So, you know, it, certainly countries have a culture. I was just in Europe recently and there are a lot of things there that were different than what we have in the United States, mm -hmm. right? Some are great and some like took a little while to get used to, but that's one reason to travel is to experience other cultures and see how other people live for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. So every business, every team of employees has a culture. And so the what creates camaraderie is when you can create a culture that's really good for the people who are part of it, mm -hmm. where they feel valued, a sense of belonging, where it's discussed quite a bit every single day as a reminder to say, hey, this is our way of doing things and, and it feels great. We care about each other. So you make that a priority. And so people aren't just loyal to the job or to you, to the boss or their need for money. They're loyal to the people who they're with. So mm -hmm. we need to have two things. Everybody needs to be on the same page in terms of the same like belief system, same thoughts. So that means they have the same goals, the same values, right? And then rituals, behaviors that reinforce that, your traditions, right? Your way of doing things. Um, you know, we had a very close group of people at my edible arrangement store. We had our rituals and traditions, but we were a kind of a warm place when the celebration business. So when someone left, everyone would say goodbye and hey, thanks a lot, that sort of thing. We hired one woman who we had a holiday coming up and she had experience working for a competitor. She had lots of skills. She was not a good cultural fit. And I broke my own rule. I hired her anyway, thinking, well, we can deal with the culture, but she has the skills. That's what we need right now. And it was terrible. Yeah, the work she could do fast, but she was terrible for the work environment. When her shift was over, she would punch out and she'd walk out and she wouldn't say goodbye to anyone. And that was sort of symptomatic of this bigger thing that she wasn't there to like talk or connect. And so I confronted her about it one day and she said, I'm just here to do my job. And it occurred to me that when I hired her, I didn't clarify her job is to support the culture. Her job <laughs> is to celebrate. Her job is to be friendly, not just with customers, but with... So that was a learning experience for me. And so um, if we want to create a sense of camaraderie, we have to make sure that everybody is sort of on the same page. And so that um, when suddenly there's a job opening at a business down the street, even if it pays more money, if people feel part of a culture that they love and where they feel loved, they're less likely to abandon it for more money. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Can I just say, I'm listening to you and I really feel inspired by your mentality and your mindset and the way you express yourself and how you tackle these things that can that come your way. And I think that you're amazing at your job and at what you do in general. So I want to, I want you to share a little bit of your wisdom for in the wealthy franchisee where you explore the mindset and habits that differentiate top franchisees from others, if you could share some key traits or habits that successful franchisees have in common and how you, can young leaders apply these principles in their areas of their life, in their everyday, day-to-day -day life? Sure. Um, I mean, I wrote this whole book about it <laughs> and in the end, I sum, I sum it up with three things. And they're really very broad things. And so I have all kinds of ideas throughout the book. But if I had to summarize it and just boil it down to three things, it's this. is first of all, keep a clear head. Look in the mirror and notice how you're thinking. Control your own thoughts and control your own emotions. Because too often these things get the best of us. And not just in business. In every area of our lives, we freak out about stuff. We get overly enthusiastic about stuff, right? We have all these emotions that that pull our thoughts and cause us to not always make the best choices. So all of these people who are successful are really good about maintaining a clear head. Um, you know, not overly positive and not overly negative, but clear. You know, one thing I like to do with a lot of my speeches is, you know, I'm sipping water because I'm on stage, but I always kind of sip the water so it's about halfway, you know, into the, uh, the cup. And then I say, you know, the, the an optimist would say the cup is, 
and, and then the audience says half full. The pessimist would say the cup is, and the audience says half empty. And I say, and the wealthy franchisee says the cup has, you know, three ounces of water you know, <laughs> using American measurements there. But the yeah. idea is that is to keep a clear head and look at data. Let that inform your decision, right? It's not about optimism or pessimism. Certainly optimism is better, but just because it's, to me, it's closer to the truth, but the truth is what we want to get to. So control your own head, control your own emotions. That's number one. Number two, in the context of a franchise business, I tell people, stick to the proven system. You've paid money for someone to teach you the system that works. Don't try to outsmart it. And this happens so often. People think, well, the franchise, the main company, what's called the franchisor, they don't know what it's like where I live. My location, my marketplace is different. Or, hey, I know something they don't. I'm smarter than they are. So even though they're telling me to do it this way, I'm going to do it this way. Very rarely is this way better. So, I mean, the franchisor is more experienced. They have more data because they're working with all these different locations. But also they understand that even if an idea really works well for one location in a franchise system, it has to work for all of them. Mm -hmm. And so what I found about all these franchisees who I wrote about who are great is none of them are especially creative or innovative. They don't want to be. They have outsourced that to the franchise or they pay them to be creative. These people just want to execute at a really high level. Mm -hmm. So stick to what works. And yeah, you're a franchise or they're imperfect, going to make mistakes. But if you're willing to make mistakes with them a little bit of the time, then you get to enjoy all the great things they're doing most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the second thing. So keep a clear head, stick to the proven system. And the third thing is something I said earlier, is use your business to improve the lives of everyone it touches. And if you really stick to that philosophy, then it means really doing right by your employees, really doing right by your customers, really doing right by everybody. And as I said, that creates loyalty and it has a boomerang effect. If, if employees feel cared about and taken care of, they're going to stick around and do a better job. If yeah. customers feel cared about and taken care of, they're going to talk about you and they're going to come back and spend more money. So those are sort of the three broad areas that really help these uh, help these franchise business owners. Definitely. And these can also help in every day-to-day -day life, whether or not you have a franchise to improve your life and the way you know, you just go about your day and experience potentially people that are mm, on a different level or mindset as you are, or if you're trying to do a business with a person that has a different mindset than you and you have to put yourself in them in their shoes and use the, the platinum rule instead of the golden rule. And so the platinum theory. And so in some way, this links to emotional intelligence. And I want to ask you now about this and leadership, which is critical, in my opinion, to business and to success. So how can young leaders start developing these skills early in their careers, whether they want to run a business or lead a team? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, it's funny. The first thing that came to my mind is listen to your podcast. <laughs> That's uh, really? Because, uh, you know, I, I don't know how every conversation goes, but so far, most of what we're talking about here is emotional intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. In in the context of, of business. Uh, and certainly business strategy is super important, right? But that goes without saying. Everybody knows hard work and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I think the emotional intelligence is what supercharges it. It's the difference between decent businesses and great businesses. Mm -hmm. So I think as a young person, the earlier you can understand that and embrace it and practice it, then the more of your life, the more of your career you'll have to then execute on it and enjoy all the benefits. And I'll say this, that for younger people, their minds are more open yes. and they haven't yet been tainted by the abuses of the world and have the scars from adversity. And, you know, when, when you're younger, you just sort of have these wide eyes and this energy and you're excited just to go out and tackle the world. It's such a great place to be in. And you're probably a little bit nervous because your confidence isn't maybe not as high as it would be after, you know, many years of life, that sort of thing. It's sort of the perfect mindset to learn and to grow. As we get older, we get tired and we get discouraged. 
and we start to get a little overconfident and we think we know everything. But to me, true wisdom is continue to understand how much you don't know and keeping your mind open and keeping yourself curious. What that means is I think it's harder to learn emotional intelligence later in life once you have these thoughts that are just locked in and once you have these habits. And so if you learn emotional intelligence and you're constantly asking about, hey, how am I impacting my own business? Am I am I a, a, an asset to my business, my career, or am I a liability to my career? How are my mm-hmm. thoughts getting in my own way? When you get in the habit of asking those questions, that becomes your way of living, your way of working, and that's going to serve you so much better. Yesterday, I did a virtual presentation for a restaurant chain in Canada, and I talked a lot about these kinds of things. And the focus of it was on hospitality and customer service, but I approached it from this idea of let's use your, your business, use your food and the experience to elevate people's emotions. And I'm getting all that. And then we did the Q&A. And this one guy just kept asking questions. That was all about just the operations and all about this beliefs. He said, how can you do all these things when all that happens is people want to go online and they want to post negative reviews so that they can get things for free? Like, He just reduced it to that and he couldn't see how much his own mentality was getting in the way, his his cynicism. He's tainted. He thinks that that's all that that there is. And I said, you're much better focused if you're worried about an occasional negative review, then make sure there's a million awesome reviews by doing a great job and asking for the reviews. But he couldn't take responsibility. He couldn't have the conversation that you and I are having. And so- For young people, I would say, get in the habit of having these kinds of thoughts, these kinds of beliefs, developing these habits early in life, and just make it your way of doing things, and you'll be way ahead of most people. I'm curious now that a question that that simply popped up as I was listening to you at the very end just now is how do you handle these sorts of people or criticism in general? How do you overcome it? Um, these kinds of people who like are criticizing me or just say- That in general have a very pessimistic view or choose to criticize your work or your beliefs by what you stand on. Um, but so it's a great question. And we're always going to have critics, right? Mm-hmm. There's always going to be people who don't believe. Um, for me, what happens, I can show up on stage and just say, you know, I'm not just a motivational speaker. I've done it. I've run the businesses and I've made money. I made money when I was running them and I made money when I sold the businesses and I dealt with adversity, personal adversity. I have had two separate bouts with cancer, different times in my life, um, totally unrelated cancers, you know, and I've had some adversity on that front. Um, but business wise, I've been through bad economies. Um, I've been through different U.S. presidents from different political parties. Um, I have been through, you know, lost key employees and all these kinds of things, but I fought through it and I did it. So I'm not just like a, a, a consultant or a speaker or a guru. Like I'm someone who's done it. I'm someone who's done the same thing as you. No one needs to talk to me about the real world or what that's like. So I can bring that credibility. Mm-hmm. And I've met so many other people who are in the same situation as that person is criticizing and you get great results. I wrote an article for a restaurant magazine about kind of what we're talking about, about how you can take your fast food employees and train them to sort of pay attention to the emotional state of the customer and ask themselves, is this customer in a hurry? Do they want to be social? Do they want to have fun? Like, kind of, you know, which is, what's, what's going on with that person in front of you? It's Again, it's the platinum rule, figuring out what they want, and then try to match your energy to that. And you know, it wasn't that deep an article or deep an idea, but just it just keeps your employees from being robotic and maybe can enhance the customer experience a little bit. This guy writes me this really nasty message saying, Hey, I just read your ridiculous article. You know, and he says, You're telling me to turn my employees into psychologists. I can barely get them to show up for work. Have you ever actually managed employees? And I'm like, Yeah, for 10 years. And I won't tell you the curse word that I thought of then. I didn't say this to him, <laughs> but I thought it. And he says, Why don't you get some more? real world experience before you start writing his articles. And I have the real world experience and I don't want to invalidate what he's going through, but I think he thinks because he can't do it, it can't be done, Mm -hmm. but I've done it. And I have stories and I have profiles in my books about all these people in his exact circumstances 
but are doing much better. So if critics confront me, and it doesn't happen that often, um, but if and when they do, if I feel it's appropriate to respond, in this case, the guy's just being a jerk and he just wrote me this unsolicited thing. I don't, I have not going to put any energy there. But if, you know, someone's asked me a question after a presentation, you know, I'll turn it back on them and say, I understand your circumstances, but these people are in the same circumstances, they're doing it. So you tell me, what, you know, what do you, what do you know that they don't or that I don't? And so uh, I try not to be combative. I want to be helpful. Um, I will say I try to preempt it. Like at the beginning of my presentations, I introduced two fictional franchise business owners. One is this woman named Anna, who's great and deals with these great things. And the other is this guy named Bob, who's really struggling. And I point out all of her thoughts and all of her behaviors and all of his thoughts and his behaviors. And a lot of people in the audience are like, okay, yeah, I sometimes do what Bob does, or I think what he, you know, I'm able to kind of paint this picture. So this way, no one's feeling defensive. I'm not saying you're making this mistake. I'm saying, well, he is. And who do you want to be more like? Anna. So, um, and in some cases, I just listen to people and say, okay, you know, thanks for your thoughts. But I know what I've done. And I know what all these great, and these great people, they're the minority. But there's enough of them to prove that really great things are possible. And these critics, they don't have any more wisdom, any more experience, or any more knowledge than I do or they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to see that you're one of those people that can see both perspectives before they take action. I think that's truly valuable in having not only a more powerful message to convey and to to send to the people, but also in general, it leads you as a more accomplished or positive person in general. And to this, I want to relate the work-life balance, which I think is something that everyone can struggle with, whether even if it's not work yet, it's perhaps education life balance. And so this is a topic that I think is very easily emotional or that can lead to stress or affect decision-making. So my question now is how what are your tactics to stay level-headed and make smarter, more strategic business decisions? And how can young professionals manage their emotions to make better choices? First of all, I want to say when it comes to work-life balance, um, your generation is better than any of the rest of us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer raised by baby boomers. And the concept of work-life balance was never really ingrained in us. The idea is just go out and, and work hard. And, you know, my parents say, hey, it, they used to say things like, we don't care what you do for a living. We just want you to be happy. Mm -hmm. I knew they didn't mean it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they want me to be happy, but really they wanted me to be stable. They wanted me to be able to be independent and not have to ask them for money. Of course, you know, they wanted me to be happy. But I think that, you know, my feeling growing up, and I think most people's feeling growing up, my generation is... Um, you just work really hard and, you know, work is about, you know, sweat. It's about grit, you know, no pain, no gain mm -hmm. that you have to suffer in order to experience pleasure and that suffering, that, that grit, that willingness to do it, to make sacrifices, to do whatever you've got to do. There's all these cliches we hear about, right. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that is just the price you pay. And, and it's, um, you know, it's something to be proud of, proud for your sacrifices. And younger generations, a little bit with millennials and definitely with Gen Z, they're like, forget that. Life is too short. I'm not here to suffer. I'm not here. And it's not that you guys don't want to make sacrifices, but you ask bigger questions. Mm -hmm. Like, why should I have to, you know, do I really have to suffer? Is it really necessary for it to be that way? And, and there's so many of you and the employers are so dependent on you. That's causing everybody to have to stop and reflect because you guys are saying, if, if I'm not psychologically safe, I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to come to work. And enough of people are saying that, that employers now have no choice but to create healthier work environments. And again, as a father of two kids who are entering the workforce, I think that's great. I want my kids to have a balanced life. I don't want it to be all about work. Um, and, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, my generation, you know, I know plenty of people who are wealthy and miserable because the cost of that wealth um, it's been a big cost and no one takes that into their account, into their accounting. And so, 
Um, I think your generation is just sort of naturally doing that. And it almost might be a better question for someone your age compared to someone my age who so many of us are getting it wrong. And so um, I do my best that I can with it. But, uh, you know, by the way, all these things that I'm talking about, about sort of mastering your mind and clearing your head and stuff like that, is something that I aspire to on a daily basis. And some days I don't get it right. Some days I give into fear and some Mm -hmm. days I give into greed. Mm -hmm. And some days I work when I should be resting. Uh, And I suppose the opposite is also true. I mean, I'm I'm only human, um, but I do the best that I can. But I think in terms of life balance, naturally your generation as a whole is going to do better. But I think there's more to your question, but I forgot what else you were asking about with that. That was- I was so caught up in the life balance. mm -hmm. That was, that mainly touched upon everything, especially that you, from what I notice, you- are very passionate about the work that you do. And I think this can also be very important when you're considering work-life balance, that if you're happy with what you do, if you're proud with the work that you do and how you help other people, then it's a lot easier for you to turn up to work every day and you're excited for it and you go for it. Like every day is the same feeling like when you started. And can I can I actually c- correct that though? Sure. Go um, for it. All right. So I have moments like where I'm talking about it, like right now, where I feel very strong and very passionate, and and I know that that's genuine when I'm not distracted by anything else. I don't even have a song in my head right now. I'm talking to you, and I'm like fully <laughs> present. It feels good when we can have something in life where we're just like totally like in the zone, and right. Mm-hmm. So that's great. But on a, on a daily basis, if I have to, you know, fly to a city and stay in a hotel so I can get up and give a speech the next day. You know, am I passionate about that? I'd say it's more like I like it a lot. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty good at it. Um, I'm not sure, that, but I don't know that we have to. I think that's another one of those cliches that you have to be passionate. Because a lot of people, they have a job and they're, they or a business, they do work. And they don't love it. They're not passionate about it. But it's fine and they like it and it pays the bills and it adheres to their values and they have a good life. And I think that's okay because not everybody can be passionate or find the thing they're passionate about. I think we find something we're pretty good at that's a little bit easier for us than other people and that we enjoy doing it and allows us to have other parts of our life. That's pretty good. And so I don't want anybody to think that if they're not passionate about something that they can't succeed. I mean, I'm passionate about my family. I'm passionate about like vacation travel, Mm -hmm. my work. I really like it a lot. I really enjoy it. I'd like to think I'm pretty good at it. Am I always passionate about it? I don't know that I am necessarily, but I don't know that you have to be. So I want to relieve people of the burden of always feeling like, yeah, because I don't even know how you make yourself passionate about something. So <laughs> it's just a slightly different perspective, but I think maybe it takes some pressure off. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. I agree. I mean, uh, to be completely honest, me as well, some, ta- some days I just procrastinate the work that I have to do because I don't feel like it's a day that I want to turn up and feel completely confident that I'm going to do everything that I've set my mind to. And sometimes not checking everything off your to-do list is also okay. Or I tend to be a very, let's say, dreamer, or perfectionist, and I have these expectations that are so high to meet. And if I don't meet them, then I base my happiness off of it. So just learning to take a step back and realize that simply turning off our work and putting in effort matters. So I agree that you corrected me on that. Yeah. And well, it's not, I don't mean to correct you because you're wise beyond your years. I feel like I would like to be asking (laughs) you questions right now, but it's sort of this this idea that's out there as is the concept. And again, this is might be different than some people is I always grew up hearing, Hey, everything you do, you got to give a hundred percent. And again, that has a lot to do with sort of, you know, my generation, older generations of us not having life balance with a hundred percent effort comes a lot of pressure it does, right? yeah. and sacrifice. And I almost found that when I give 80%, I do better work because I'm working with less anxiety and less pressure. And I'm leaving a little bit of stuff for my mental and personal health mm-hmm. that again, I believe that we have to work very hard and I'm proud of that. And that, and especially when someone's counting on us, I think we need to give them a lot. But I also think we need those days where we sit on the couch and eat ice cream. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to leave a little something for ourselves. And I don't always need to be in first place. I don't always need to be the very best. 
I'm pretty cool at being high up on the list Mm -hmm. and having balance. And um, I don't know. I just think we always need to challenge those messages that we get in our heads and those things that create anxiety and pressure. Um, You know, I understand, you know, in the Olympics, the difference between a gold medal and a a silver medal, right? The gold medal, the one they're getting the endorsements and they get to say that they're a gold medalist, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I think even to be an Olympian in general, there's a lot of sacrifice. There's a lot of stuff that goes there. And I just think we need to, we invest a lot more than money. We invest time, money we can get back, but time Mm -hmm. we're never going to get back. And so again, to give a hundred percent to something, I don't know, sometimes I wonder if just dial it back a little bit and it might put you in a better mental state or you'll actually do better. Mm-hmm. So just uh, another way of thinking about it, especially for anybody who aspires not to have total success, but a lot of joy and freedom and balance. Mm-hmm. And look at you answering the work-life balance question absolutely flawlessly. <laughs> and finally, almost, I want to draw you back to some key takeaways from specifically your book that you didn't touch upon a lot, which is Stop the Shift Show and have a couple of things that you could tell listeners that will imme- that they could immediately apply to their own startups or leadership roles as almost a final message. Uh, sure. So um, yeah, so the, the book is called Stop the Shift Show, Turn Your Struggling Hourly Workers into a Top Performing Team. So obviously there in the main title, there is a pun making reference to an expression that we use quite a bit in English and here in the United States. The word is not actually shift. It's another uh, profane word that we are not supposed to say, but employers say all the time, right? So uh, I use it a pun to say shift because it's shift workers. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, and for most people, it is a shift show. It is a struggle with their employees. And I hear people talk about how they hate their employees. They use that word hate because it just drives them crazy. And mm-hmm. so what I found is there's a million books and speakers and gurus and experts on management and mm-hmm. on leadership. But hourly workers are completely different than those who are earning a salary. Mm -hmm. And all these businesses, they do market research to figure out which part of the market they want to sell to, they want to market to, because that Mm -hmm. part of the market is different than this other one. So if I have a product or service that I want to sell to 18-year-olds, I'm going to develop that and market it differently than something I'm going to sell to senior citizens, Mm -hmm. right? Well, just as different sectors of the market are unique, so are different sectors of the labor market. Mm -hmm. And the hourly employee is totally different than those on salary, but there's no one out there who's talking about those differences, appreciating them and helping people learn how to manage that sector, the workforce. I am trying to become that person. I want to fill that space and I want to support people who manage that kind of worker. So that is what that book is about, how to manage those kinds of people. And my approach in the book, there's a lot of tactics there, but it's similar to so much of what we've been talking about. It's to understand what motivates these people. Again, the platinum rule, because what motivates them might not be what motivates you. And it might not be what motivates people in a salary setting. You know, they have different circumstances, that sort of thing. Also, hourly workers tend to have uh, less job experience. They tend to have less education and often they're much younger. Well, if you're 25 years of age or lower, your brain is still developing. You're not yet the person that you're going to be. Mm -hmm. And so we can't, you know, hire a 20 year old and have expectations as if they're a 40 year old, right? Because they're still growing and they're still changing. So part of we have to do with as long with, with is be patient, but we have to help with their undeveloped brains and help them grow, help them understand what culture is, help them understand what their role is that we need to, again, put ourselves in check and notice, are we being patient when we train? Are we training properly? Or are we doing what most managers do is we show someone how to do something and then say, got it? Have any questions? And they're scared. They're nervous. They don't even know what they don't know. And they just say, yeah, I got it. They're thinking, I'll figure it out later. That's not how you train. Because what is training? You're trying to rewire their brain and help them acquire a new skill. Well, what is it that wires brains? It's a lot more than just showing someone to do something and then having them do it and then walking away. Mm -hmm. So I talk about 
how to train, how to conduct better job interviews to really know if they're the right person for you. I have a whole section on coaching employees where uh, based on some criteria, you can diagnose what an employee needs for a specific situation and based on your diagnosis, then learn how to coach them because everybody needs to be coached differently in different situations. Um, I so then I talk about, you know, understanding your own management style uh, and even your own training. This is something I was interesting. I discovered um, 90 percent of people who are put into a management position will have that role for 10 years before they ever are formally trained on managing people. They might be trained on how to manage the business, but in terms of how to build culture and how to have influence and how to motivate people, most people, 90%, are never taught these things you know, for like 10 years. And how do most people become managers in that setting? They're really good at the job, so they get promoted. But management is a different job with different skills, but they're not taught those things. So to bring out the best in hourly workers, we need to acquire those skills. We need to understand our own biases, our own habits, where we learned leadership and ask ourselves, are those lessons really good? Right? Mm -hmm. Or am I just, you know, continue to pass on this legacy of bad management? So we need to understand the differences of hourly workers. You know, they have, so be, like one example I'll share with you is because they might have less education, less experience, hourly workers don't do as well with abstract concepts. So if you have some big, dramatic, over-the-top mission statement where you say, these are our values, they're like, what? What are you talking about? Like we have to bring that stuff down to earth. So instead of saying, I want you here to act with integrity, give them a list of agreements and saying, hey, we always tell the truth. We always follow through in our commitments. And by doing these things, we're now demonstrating integrity. We want to like be very clear so that people know what's expected of them and what integrity looks like. Just using the abstraction, it doesn't work. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff. So um, I just threw a lot out there. Hopefully there's something helpful there. But the important takeaway is that hourly workers are different than those on salary. We need to adjust our management style to accommodate them. Yes, I love that. And that, I think, perfectly sums up off today's conversation and tackling everything from franchise building to how we grow to how we tackle criticism to all of the knowledge that I think is so valuable that a listener can just take away and implement in their everyday lives. So Scott, as we and the uh, as we reach the end of today's discussion, as any parting advice for any young listeners just starting out their careers, what advice do you want to leave them with? The question I'm asking in my head is, if my kids asked me that question today, what would I say to them? I would say to them, I do say to them, you're better than you think. Take on challenges that are bigger and harder than you think you can handle. Mm -hmm. uh, and then figure it out once you're there because you're probably smarter than you think, you're better than you think, you can handle more. Mm -hmm. So pursue more than you think is possible. Definitely. Uh, because, because it's closer to the truth. Most of us are, are a bit short-sighted. Um, and then once you're there, you know, work hard, be curious, but just focus on making people's lives better. Put value out into the world and there'll always be uh, a need for you. Definitely. And I think that's beautiful because actually putting yourself up to new opportunities that you think are so far to reach can end up surprising you and leaving you with this feeling of accomplishment to see just how much you're capable of. So thank you, Scott, for being here on the Smarter Podcast today. I hope you'll have best of luck in the future with everything that you do. And thank you for sharing this valuable information to our listeners. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, if you ever start a big company, let me know because I want to buy as much stock in you as possible. <laughs> I definitely will. Thank you, Scott. Before we continue, I want to talk to you briefly about this amazing organization called SOS Children's Villages. 
SOS Children's Villages Romania has been providing children in need with a safe, clean home, healthy food, a good education, and the love and the care that they need. I know they're literally saving children's lives as I had the chance to donate books to them and sit down and talk with them. All donations are highly appreciated and you can donate online to SOS Children's Villages Romania at the link in the description below and change a child's life forever. You heard it from Scott Greenberg. Take on more challenges than you think is possible because you are capable of doing more. And to that, I want to leave you freshly on that clean slate to tackle on your new opportunities, your new adventures, and work on your goals for the next two weeks until the next episode arrives. Also, if I could ask you a favor, if you could please share this episode with a loved one or with a friend that you know is interested in making a business, especially a franchise, or just if you want to know what it takes to lead a multi-million dollar franchise. Thank you for doing that because it helps us keep bringing guests in top industries. And if no one told you this today, I want to be the first one that tells you that I believe in you and I believe in your ability to create the life of your dreams. See you next time. Bye-bye.